Well, everyone, welcome, welcome. Um, Andrew Bolton and I uh, welcome you to this webinar of the Gadford Elm Chapel in Worcestershire, uh, the oldest Latter-day Saint chapel that we have. In the world. We welcome each of you to the eighth webinar of the British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association. The British Isles History Association um, is independent of any church and seeks to involve everyone from enthusiast to scholar in church history in these aisles. We uh, welcome different perspectives um, and clashing views, but always insist on civility and respect. So say what you like, but say it with kindness and courtesy. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our speaker. This is Bernard Hoare. Um, he's a member of the Worcester Ward of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he has nurtured the Gadford Elm Chapel for years. Bernard will speak for about 30 minutes. And then if you have any questions or comments in the chat function, do it as we go, and I'll monitor that later on. So Bernard. A very warm welcome and over to you. It's nice to be here with you today to um, talk about Gadford Elm. It's the uh, place I have uh, loved for the last 12 years. Me and my uh, wife have been the missionaries there for 12 years and uh, we've met lots, lots of wonderful people and uh, we've done a lot of research on, on the chapel. So I'd like to start off by uh, sharing a screen. Um, the Gadford Elm Chapel stands in the corner of South Worcestershire, close to the Gloucestershire border. It's 130 miles from London, uh, 110 miles from Liverpool, and that's where, where, where it is. It's um, down a little lane, as you can see, and it's very difficult to find at times. Um, and we've had many people lost going down there. But it's a lovely place down a little narrow lane. Um, the the um, building was built by the United Brethren, and uh, there were a group of people that um, uh, disenchanted some uh, size with the with the method with the, the Methodists, the um, uh, the um, sorry the primitive Methodists, and they, they broke off from there. And Thomas Kington founded a group called the United Brethren in in 1832. And a lot of members joined with him, and he uh, built up quite a group of people around the area. They, um, they wanted to look for a more formal way of, of, of worshipping and they um, set up a, a system very similar to the Methodists of they had a preacher's plan and they had a lot of preachers. Um, let me just... Uh, and they met in people's homes. Uh, if you were living in the area and you were a United Brethren and you had a home that they registered for worship a preacher would come to you each Sunday and preach to you in your home. Um, the preacher's plan looked like this. I know you probably can't see that very well, but basically it is a list of homes, which is down there, a list of numbers with preachers there, and a, a date across the top, and the preacher drops in the little column there. Very simple, like, like an old spreadsheet, I suppose. Um, and this is what the uh, United Brethren people uh, preachers used. So you would know if you lived in uh, this place here, I can't see it because it's small on my screen, and you would know that this number of preacher over there would be visiting you that week. They were set up into two areas, um, uh, in the, and they had the Frooms Hill Conference of Stanley Hill area, and the other area was down by the Gadford Elm. By 1836, uh, they had grown to quite a big group in both areas. And so they wanted a sort of a headquarters, a meeting place where they could meet together rather than in some people's homes. So they purchased land at Gadford Elm in 1836 and built the chapel. Um, they had around three to 400 people at that time. And the, uh, the, the, the building had to be built within two miles of a Church of England or a Catholic church at the time. Uh, that was just the rule, and that is why it's down a little lane in the middle of nowhere, because they had to be that distance away from the uh, the other churches. There is a church about two miles in Aldersfield and about two miles in Staunton, and that's why it's, it's selected to go there. 
Um, they held their first meeting in there in uh, 1837, um, about a year and a half after they started building it. And um, they then used it for uh, their own meetings and uh, conferences. And all in all, they were a very happy bunch of people that uh, were just looking for uh, light and truth. And they um, uh, wanted to uh, find the way that that they should worship. Uh, they were looking basically for uh, a, a church that was similar to the times of Jesus Christ. And and Thomas Kington was the leader of that and very fervent in his in his beliefs. But if we now go back uh, to 18, 1839, when uh, um, Joseph Smith decided that he would like to send his uh, uh, eight of his apostles over to Britain on a mission and that they would be going over there to teach the people of Great Britain uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, they didn't all leave together. Um, Wilfred Woodruff and uh, John Taylor set off themselves. First of all, the other apostles were quite ill. John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff weren't that well neither. But that, those two set off and um, they arrived in England, in Liverpool, in January of, of 1840. They quickly went to a meeting in Manchester to decide where they were going to go. The church was already established in that area in 1837. E.B.C. Kimball was over here and he, pre he preached in the area and baptised a number of people. So there were members there. So they went to a meeting in Manchester to decide where they should go. Um, they decided that um, Wilfrid Woodruff would go to the Potteries, which was quite a strong area, and John Taylor, I believe, went north. Um, after uh, they, they left uh, Manchester, Wilfrid Woodruff arrived in the Potteries, and he met a man there called William Bembo. Now, William Bembo uh, was a brother of John Bembo, who lived in Herefordshire. William informed uh, Wilfrid Woodruff of the United Brethren group that were down in Herefordshire. And so um, Wilfred Woodruff prayed about this and on March the 2nd, he got the inspiration that he should go down to Herefordshire and meet this John Bembo. Uh, William said he would take him down and they left on uh, March the 4th, March the 3rd, sorry, um, to travel down to the, the uh, pottery, the, down from the potteries down to um, Herefordshire. Uh, Wilfred Woodruff, uh, that's painting of Wood Wilfred Woodruff he had in 1841, and that's what he looked like. Wilfred Woodruff was 33 years of age when he was over here. This is the route that they took. They came down from Hanley, down to Stafford, down to Wolverhampton. They stayed the night in Wolverhampton, and on March the 4th, they arrived at the John Bembo farm. Um, John and Jane Bembo met them and that first night they talked for quite a while about the gospel and about the United Brethren. Um, John Bembo was a, a tenant farmer. He uh, uh, managed the farm just like a farm manager would today. He didn't own the farm. Um, the farm was owned by Jane's, uh, um, I think it was Jane's auntie or something. Uh, yes, Jane's auntie. And she, she owned the farm and let it out to John and Jane Bembo. So he, he, he was quite wealthy because he owned all the livestock and all the equipment on the farm. And so, as he says in, the, in his diary, that, that Wilfred Wood in his diary, he was a wealthy farmer. So he was quite well off and he was quite um, a well off in the United Brethren. Um, this is the place where he visited. This is the same house as John Bembo lived in. And um, just through there is a barn. And that is where that they, that um, John Bembo, uh, Wilfred Woodruff would preach. This is the pond where the baptisms took place. And on the 6th of March, 1840, the first six baptisms took place in that pond. There were John and Jane Bembo and four of the United Brethren preachers. The following day, John Bem uh, Wilfred Woodruff cleared out the pond uh, to make sure that it was deep enough to have many more baptisms, which he says in his, his journal that um, uh, he was sure there was going to be a lot more um, uh, baptisms in the in the, in the area, um, and each day for the next day, uh, next thirty odd days, right into sort of first week in April, uh, he was baptizing constantly 
in various ponds, not only in the Bembo pond, but in other ponds around the area. And uh, in March of eight, uh, March the 17th, uh, he met with, with, um, with uh, Thomas Kington. And Thomas Kington, as I've said before, was the leader of United Brethren. And Thomas Kington said to uh, uh, Wilfred Woodruff, I will study your church, study your book, and if I find it to be true, I will join it and uh, live it to all my, the best ability I can. But if I find that I don't believe it, then I will oppose it uh, quite vigorously. Anyway, three days later, four days later, on March the 21st, he baptised Thomas Kington. After Thomas Kington was baptised, a lot of the United Brethren decided that they would um, now look into what Wilfred Woodruff was preaching, and most of them joined the church. Um, and by April the 10th, he had baptised 160 people. Uh, not all of them were United Brethren because he was preaching everywhere and people would listen and would uh, accept his message and they, they would be baptised. So on April the 10th, he, he, he was thinking about, I've got to go here, I've got to go there, they want me here, they want me everywhere. And um, he didn't just didn't have other resources to be everywhere. So he went to a conference that weekend in Manchester and he came back with Brigham Young and Willard Richards. He'd written previously to Willard Richards asking him, could he, um, could he come, come down and help him out? And so he came back with these two, uh, Brigham Young and Willard Richards, and he was then able to spread the work across the area. And um, Brigham would go one way, Willard Richards would go another way, and Wilfred Woodruff would go the other way. And that's when they started to spread around the area. And the, the, the message got around very quickly. And by June the 14th, 1840, on that Sunday, the, they had a meeting at the Gadford Am Chapel. And uh, I'll read it to you. The preachers and members of the Brand Green and Gadford Am branch of the Froome's Hill Circuit of the United Brethren met at the Gadford Am Chapel. On June the 14th, 1840, Worcestershire, England, pursuant to previous notice, when the meeting was called to order by Elder Thomas Kington, Elder Willard Richards was chosen president and Elder Daniel Browett chosen clerk for the meeting. The meeting opened by prayer, by Elder Woodruff remarks were then made by the president respecting the business of the day and the necessary changes must take place. It was moved by Elder Thomas Kington, seconded by Elder D. Browett, that this meeting be hereafter known by the name, the Brand Green and Gadford Elm Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organised and established by the will of the commandment of God. That's from Wilfred Woodruff's journal of June the 14th. On that day, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints became the ownership of a, ch a chapel in England. At that time, they didn't have any chapels. Um, they'd only been in Nauvoo, or Commerce at the time, Nauvoo later, uh, for a, just about six, nine months. Um, they had a building in Kirkland, which was the temple, but that wasn't a chapel. And so in inverted commas, um, this is the oldest Latter-day Saint chapel in the world today. Um, it has uh, <clears throat> been um, used by the, uh, the church after that for um, three, three conferences and lots of church meetings. Um, and the reason that Wilfred Woodruff had come over here, as I said earlier, was to convert the people so that they would travel um, over to America to uh, enhance the church in Nauvoo. And um, this is what had happened. In September of 1840, um, John Bembo took a party over to, um, to America. He paid for 40 of them from the sale of his equipment at the farm. And uh, then there was a lot more ships uh, sailing sort of every sort of two or three weeks from either Bristol or Liverpool over to New York or New Orleans and then the people travelling on to Nauvoo. So in 1841, at the end of 1841, um, they were wondering what they should do with the chapel as there wasn't many people uh, in the area that um, uh, were, still act were still members of the church. Also, as people were joining the church after Wilfred Woodruff left, um, they soon were on the, on ships and 
uh, crossing to Nauvoo. So it was decided they would sell the, uh, the chapel. And uh, the chapel was sold to a local farmer. And the money that they gained from the chapel, they used to help other people uh, emigrate to Nauvoo. Uh, the local farmer hands changed probably three times during that period. Um, we don't know much about the history of it, only that it was used as a, a farm building. Um, a German lived there in the 1950s and 60s and turned it into a home. Uh, he was a prisoner of war that had been uh, uh, told that he could stay in Britain and, and have a family. Um, and he lived there. He left in about uh, the mid 60s and uh, the building just stood there and rapidly deteriorated and um, fell into great despair. Um, lots of people walked, would walk up the lane and look at the, the old building and falling down, the walls were getting uh, worse and the roof was caving in. But in uh, 1994, the building came up for sale and it was an auction at uh, a public house in Eldersfield, about two miles from the chapel. Members of the church around the Cheltenham area and Gloucester area knew all about the, um, the, the history of the building. And uh, Brother Gardner, who was the Bishop of Hereford at the time, thought we just must do something to make sure that we can save this building. So he raised some money, some local members, and he went to the auction. And he was fortunate to, uh, to win the auction. Um, there was another farmer that was sort of wanting the area. It was up for sale for one derelict building and 11 acres of farmland. The uh, 11 acres of farmland they didn't really want. They just wanted one acre. So a sort of a deal was done between Bishop Gardner and the farmer. And uh, they purchased the one acre and the derelict building for around 5,000 pounds. Then the work had to start to um, start to uh, reconstruct it. The walls, as I said, were shot and, and the roof was caved in. So the walls were Two of the walls were taken down. The numbers were uh, numbers of the bricks. The, num the bricks were numbered, sorry, and uh, they on the floor. And when they were put back up, they were put back up in the in the same position. Um, obviously, there were lots of uh, bricks missing, and uh, there was a little building about uh, five five hundred yards down the um, uh, lane there, and uh, they were approached for, for the uh, bricks because it was derelict too and the farmers said they could have them. And they were transported up to the um, uh, main building by the BYU dancers. Uh, people smile at that, but the BYU dancers are a dance group that uh, uh, come over to England and perform in various places around the country. That day they were performing in the Cheltenham uh, Town Hall and they'd heard about the restoration of the chapel. So they came out to the chapel and um, Brother Gardner put 50 young uh, people down the road in a line and he said they fitted perfectly and the bricks were all delivered down in one afternoon. That's just a little story about the restoration of the chapel. Um, the chapel was finally finished in um, the year uh, 2000. Uh, it took uh, sort of five years of, of building, mainly from donated labour from members around the Cheltenham area. And um, there was a few professional people, obviously, the, a professional a stonemason was, uh, was, was there doing most of the, well, doing all the brickwork, really. Um, so it was finished in the year 2000, and it was dedicated not as a church building, but as a building that was owned by the trust that had been formed uh, to restore it. And President Holland, who is a, an apostle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, uh, was a direct, is a direct descendant of one of the um, people that uh, emigrated to Nauru in the 1840s and uh, he, he was uh, came over here and dedicated the building um, as a building of interest to members of the church and to the general public. The trust then run the building for four years and um, accepted the donations um, from the public who visited. Um, after that um, the, the church in 2004 uh, heard about, well, I didn't hear about it, they knew about it, and they decided they would like it as a historical building. And President Hinckley, the president of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints at the time, uh, came down and dedicated the building as a uh, 
um, an historical building for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The, <clears throat> the, then the missionaries was, were chosen to call, were called to um, uh, look after the building and they, they gave uh, uh, meet, uh, presentations and uh, advice and, uh, and um, showed interest. Uh, and people who showed interest, they, they also did some work on some of the ancestors as well. Um, and there's been missionaries there ever since. Me and my wife were called 12 years ago <laughs> to do a two year mission. And somehow we got left there, but we were quite happy to do that. And we really enjoyed doing that. Um, now the, uh, the building is um, uh, uh, finished. It's, it's, it's um, there for people to visit whenever they like. Missionaries are there. Uh, most can be there most of the time if, if, if an appointment wants to be made. Um, we also at the at the site uh, we run camps and we run firesides and we run all sorts of events in the summer for uh, our church members. Um, the building today um, has a plaque outside it explaining the the story that I've basically uh, said to you. Um, the the foyer has got a uh, the Christus there and displays around the air, around the uh, foyer uh, telling you about John Bembo and Thomas Kington. This is the inside of the chapel. Uh, I'm showing these because I, I know a lot of you haven't been there. Um, and that's these, these benches were actually obtained from a, uh, a religious artifacts company in, in uh, South Wales. And these were, were produced at the same time in the 1840s. They were brought up and cleaned. The chapel is laid out in that area in that way. Um, because that's how so a standard chapel would be laid out with a pulpit at the front and the seats going back. But we have no uh, knowledge of how the chapel was laid out when the United Brethren had it. Um, but we had a Methodist um, minister come and see us a few years ago. And as he walked in, he said, this just reminds me of a, a small Methodist chapel. And then I got thinking, well, of course it would be because Thomas Kington was a primitive Methodist before he formed the United Brethren and he uh, modeled the United Brethren on the Methodist uh, way of uh, doing things. So his chapel would be in the Methodist design. Um, visitors from all over the world come every, uh, every so often, but we see them all the time. Um, they come from the United States mainly, um, but the, the people that uh, we love coming are the descendants of the people that um, uh, went in 1840 over to Nauru. We have some more displays upstairs outlining the restoration, the people who who um, uh, left the area, and just a history of the, the church from 1837. Uh, but um, the, the chapel, we, my wife has said, it's just a monument to those people that left this area. Um, it's just bricks and mortar, and, but it stands there as a monument to all those um, tremendous saints that uh, joined the church and uh, under Wilfred Woodruff and uh, left this area. Um, the chapel today, I can't read that because the people are <laughs> on the side of it. But uh, today, as I said, the chapel uh, stands as a monument to people who joined the church. They traveled across in ships for up to six weeks on the sea. If you read many of their journals, a lot of them lost children on the way uh, over to Nauru and later when they crossed the plains, the 3,000 miles in wagons or hand carts, many people also uh, died. They went through the hardships of Nauru when uh, they were, uh, the mobs uh, came and told them to leave. But these people um, uh, were fantastic people. And I'd just like to read um, from all of their diary of, of, of um, what they, uh, they went through before they left. I won't say who they are. It says, oh, the grief and sorrow of this time, I can never forget. Thus on the 4th of May, 1841, I left all that was near and dear to me to travel some thousands of miles alone and cast my lot with the people of God. Another one said, embracing it, I had much opposition while I remained here. But in August, 1841, I left my native land and brothers and sisters, which had numbered seven besides myself. My sister, one of the men, had been baptized, accompanied me to Liverpool, where older 
where an older one, Elizabeth, was baptized by John Taylor, but both went back and left the church. I missed my family greatly. Another one said, we had a beautiful home in the parish of Suckley, Worcestershire, and were members of a religious body called the United Brethren. We had only to hear Wilfred Woodruff once, and William and I knew with all our hearts that was offering a priceless treasure. We accepted this offer and were baptized into the church. We dreamed of going to Zion. We could not be with the main saints because the money was a problem. And a year later, my husband William died and I had to wait until the petrol, in, petrol, in, petrol emigration fund uh, was available. But one great uh, message from someone in their diary says, I shall never forget the first sight of the Great Salt Lake Valley and rejoicing in every heart to find a haven of rest from the mob violence we have experienced. We were received with kindness by the saints and made welcome to Zion in the valley of peace and happiness. So these people who left this area, they uh, was a great sacrifice for them. And that's why the Gadsford Am Chapel today is that monument to them and people can come and visit there. We have people come who uh, they would like, just like to sit in the chapel and realize that this is the place where our ancestors joined the church and heard Wilfred Woodruff or Brigham Young preach. Their ancestors may not have sat in that chapel because they might have been way away from the area, but it still acts as a, as a memorial to them of their ancestors. Just like to just go through a few of these people. Thomas Oakley, he waited in England until the perpetual fund allowed his family to join the saints. They were members of the Willie Hancock Company. His daughter Rhoda died just one day from the end of the journey. She was the final death on the trail. Anne Jewel Rowley traveled to America alone when her husband died. She was a member of the Willie Hancock Company. When her family had no food, she placed a stale biscuit in a pan and prayed for a miracle. That evening, her family had sufficient food. She buried a daughter in a shallow grave on the trail. William Pitt was the leader of the Narbu Brass Band. He helped paint the Narbu Temple, as well as the Beehive and Lion House after settling in Utah. Edward Phillips served in the rock quarry for the Narbu Temple. He helped to settle Kaysville, Utah, and donated $500 towards the construction of the Kaysville Tabernacle. Anne Green settled in Fillmore, Utah, where she was first midwife and doctor. Even the Indians trusted the white herb doctor. She worked as a midwife until the age of 90. William Carter was chosen by Brigham Young to go to final and find a home for the saints in the West. He plowed the first half acre of ground in the Salt Lake City. He went on to settle St. George. John Roby settled in Tooele Valley, where he served as a representative in a legislative assembly of Utah. Mary Ann Weston disguised herself to escape men sent to bring her back on her way to America. She was the first Relief Society president and midwife in Tooele. So those are the sort of people that left this area. I have uh, nearly 50 people, which I could have put up on the screen, but that's too many for a presentation. But all these people came from around this area. And that's why the Gadford Elm Chapel is such a, an important part of this area. Um, because of these people that left it. None of them ever really gained uh, a, a high position in the church, um, but they all served as best they could in the positions they were called. Most of them, probably 80% of them, did go to Nauru and suffered the trials of Nauru. And, um, but they were, they were wonderful people. And they all, a lot of them all lived to be quite an, an old age too um, when, they, when they arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, that's basically the end of my presentation, but I'd just like to say that, um, if you can read that, uh, there was a, a, a sister missionary in Worcester um, seven or eight years ago, and um, she loved, she loved Gadfield Elm, and she decided that she would, um, uh, well, when she went back to Utah, she went to BYU to do media studies, and as a part of a course at the end, she was asked that all the students were asked if they could do a documentary on a church historical site. And she went to a tutor and said, uh, I want to do Gadford Elm. And the tutor didn't know where Gadford Elm was. 
he wasn't a tutor of history, he was a tutor of media studies. And when she explained what it was, she got the funds to come back and she made a video uh, of, of 45 minutes, a documentary, and it is shown on YouTube. And um, if you want to see it, just put in Godfrey Down Chapel and uh, Saving the Church, the story of Godfrey Down Chapel, and you, you see it on YouTube. And um, that's that explains everything that I've basically told you tonight, but in but in a film. Um, we're hoping one day that the church can put a, a similar film out about Godfrey Down Chapel and about the Bembo uh, experience that Wilfred Woodruff had in the mission of Wilfred Woodruff too. Um, but this documentary and another film, which was made thirty odd years ago, is the only two that we that we know about. Um, as I said, there are uh, other places that Wilfred Woodruff went, and these are some of the other places that he went. He went to Herefordshire Beacon, he went to Ledbury, and he went to Dimmock, as well as Gadfrey Down and Bembo Pond. When we have visitors, this is the route that I take them all out. We start at Bembo's Pond, we go to Ledbury, we then go to Dimmock, we go to Gadfrey Down, and then I make them climb the Herefordshire Beacon. And that's, that's the trip that, that I've done as a missionary for a number of years now. And um, this really gives you a, a, um, an experience of the area. Um, any questions? I will now. Okay. <laughs> We've got a few questions for you, Bernard. So first off, um, Alex has asked, are there any contemporary records, journals, or newspaper articles from the unconverted in the local area that refer to either Gadford Elm or Froome Hill? There are a, there are a few, uh, if you go into the Gloucestershire or Worcestershire um, uh, archives, there are some newspaper articles uh, about um, the Mormons in 1840. In fact, there's quite a good one about the persecution they had from the uh, Reverend in the village of Dimmock. Um, and there are some other articles as well. We haven't come across, I have come across one person that actually is a, a descendant of somebody who, who went to uh, Utah, um, uh, a lady called Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Robry, and she lives in Ledbury. It was her sister. Uh, she, it's from the, she's from the sister of a person who went to, uh, to um, uh, Nauvoo. But I haven't come across that many. I've read many journals that are the church have got of the people who went, but not all around the area. We have given presentations to uh, things like the Women's Institute of um, Pendock, and then there was a man there that knew all about it, and he, he was going to let me have some records, but he didn't didn't come back to me. Um, so not very many, not very many, I don't think. Okay. Um... Justice Mannings asked, are the chapel pews, are they the original or are they restored? They are, they are original chapel pews from a, a, a chapel in Wales and they have been uh, cleaned up. They are the original there. They just when they came, they were in a fairly dirty state, but they were all clean. And um, yeah, they are original. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, Brad Wellin has asked, um, I've already got an answer from somebody else on this, but I'm going to throw it to you first. Brad Wellings asked, are there lists of members of the Gadford Elm? He'd like to see if he's related to them. I have a, uh, a list of uh, all the people that I've come across so far. Um, and that numbers around about, I don't know, six, seven hundred. Um, I have those in a spreadsheet, big spreadsheet. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a list of those. If, if, if if um, uh, I can, I can um, email you that, uh, Peter, and then you can send it out to the other people. Okay. Just on that, um, I don't know if everybody's aware, there's actually a project called the Wilford Woodruff Papers, and Jennifer Mackley has responded on the chat here, saying that from Wilford Woodruff's journal, there is actually a list of people that he lists. That, of course, is not everybody. And many of those have biographical sketches included on them as well so that's worth going on to the Wilford Woodruff papers which lists his journal and all, all his involvement on there. the list the list is that he kept a little diary of all the baptisms a little tiny book 
which if you in the church archives it's sort of clipped inside his diary it's only a small little little book and he he noted down there all the people that he baptized and all the baptisms he was notified of by uh, the other people who were baptized but um a lot of people did a lot of baptisms and didn't record them but um you know is, is that little book is um got i think nearly 480 names in it and then you you pick you pick up other names from his diary that he didn't put in there and you also pick up names from other people's journals as well so yeah um on that alex has asked are copies of these records held at gadford elm can you see any of these lists and stuff yes yeah if you come to visit gadford elm upstairs in the room we have um not the originals but we have copies of of um uh, I have printed out Wilfred Woodruff's journal uh, if you wanted to read that at Gadford Elm for the time he was in the area. Um, and that's there. And all these names are there if you want. They're all in a book um, and lots of pictures and lots of um, uh, short stories about the people who left. And those are in the displays or in a book as well. Okay. Um, Richard and Luetta have asked, what about Apostle Parley P. Pratt? He was involved with the Manchester Hymnal. Was he involved in this area as he well? Never, he never came down to this area. Um, but yeah, he was involved in the hymnal and uh, money was raised from this area to help produce the hymnal. Um, Thomas Kington and John Bembo donated money to help print the Book of Mormon, a hymnal and the Millennial Star. But uh, there's no record of Barley Prefat ever coming down this area. Not that I'm aware of. I'm not saying he didn't, but I, I'm 100% yeah. certainly didn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Alex has asked also, she says, I noticed there's a parish church located right next to the Bembo's farm. You've mentioned that there's two, two miles away. And she says, I wondered if the minister there at the time made any record of events. Um, we, I know the, the minister there at the moment, well, the, the lay preacher there is Mrs. Manning, who uh, actually owns the Bembo farm now. Um, she hasn't found any records of, of anything that the vicar recorded happened up at the Bembo farm. Um, that's all I know. She, she, she is very, very um, into, into more ministry as well as her own history of the church. Um, but she hasn't found any records what noted at that time of the, the things that happened up at the Bembo farm. Okay. Yeah. Um, just, uh, oh, so a question from Doreen Wynn. Where would any possible records have been stored? They must have taken a lot of them back to America with them because the, the archives of the church seem to have them. Um, there are records in the local Worcestershire, Herefordshire, Gloucestershire archives. Um, I, I don't really know where. I mean, I've looked in all those places and all I've uh, found is a few few newspaper articles and a few um, yeah, articles like that. Uh, um, I've, I've, we found the, um, the, uh, the licenses that they had for all the ho houses uh, kept in those those are those um, record offices um, and also the the um, the plans and the uh, um, records from Gadsford Down when it was built are in the in the uh, Worcestershire archives so you can go and see the original plans there um, yeah I, that's all I can think of really um, okay. um, this is a question from Verena Blackburn. She says, I'm watching from Washington State in America. I grew up in Provo, Utah. I recognize many of the names as those who were neighbors and friends and salute the boost to the church in early Utah these converts and immigrants gave. I have a family member who makes these kind of movies you're perhaps hoping for about this early history. Um, oh, and we can give you, so she's asking for contact information, um, which we can share later on. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um just talking statistics earlier on we were talking do you just want to share the statistics you know one of the things that's often uh, quoted is all but one of the 600 joined can you talk about what your knowledge is of 
how many joined and, and left? Um, since I've been studying this for 12 years now, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's only mentioned in Wilfred Woodruff's diary once or twice, about 600. Mm -hmm. And this is when he recorded, this is when he recorded his diary probably 40 years after the, the, the 1840s. So it was in the 1880s when you find it in his diary. Um, I, I can't, and, and a number of other people have worked with me, said they can't reconcile that there was 600 and they all joined by one. Um, a few theories about that is that um, uh, the United Brethren didn't really keep really good records of all their members. And um, I, I just don't think that that is a fact that uh, there were 600 and all but one joined. Um, I was asked not long ago, can you tell me who the one was? <laughs> I said, I can't tell because I don't know the 600 for a start off. It's, it's one of those um, stories I think has been handed down. I don't like to say that, but that's what I feel about it. It's, it seems strange that there was exactly 600 and one of them didn't join. That doesn't ring, bell, ring, ring true with me. But it may be, I'm not saying it isn't, but I, I, I can't, can't reconcile. What, what, what's the figures of how many joined though? Um, uh, in rough, not just from the United Brethren, the whole area, I mean. But well, the whole area, Wilfred Woodruff says that yeah, 1800 odd people joined. Um, and that could very well be true, as I said, lots of people were baptised and there was no record of them made. Um, and if you read some of the, the things, the journals from Nauvoo, they got baptised again or they got baptised because there was no record of them being baptised or they couldn't remember why they were back when they were baptised. Um, it's a, it's a, <laughs> I don't know what, what, what I can say about it, it's just a, a lot of figures which we can't definitely prove are, are, are right. Um, it's, Wilfrey well, would have said there was around 1800, there probably was around 1800, but we can't find, I've had people, mem, mem, a good friend of mine, Mary Poaching, did a lot of research on it. She couldn't find anywhere near 1800 people that were recorded and she worked on it for quite a while. She's passed away now. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's difficult to say um, how many people really. Um, okay. It's just figures coming from history that says there was 1800 people, but uh, trying to prove that is very difficult. Yeah. Um, Lynn Barry says, I'm currently transcribing Welsh member records from the 1840s in the ROC program, and there must be similar member records which the church would hold for the Gadfield Elm branch. Yes, so there, is the, there, there is the British records, the British mission records, which are kept in uh, the church uh, headquarters. Um, yeah, you just go into those and find. We've got a few names off there as well, uh, extra names to make up this number, but um, we still can't reconcile to the 1800, but yeah, there are records kept in the uh, historical uh, in Salt Lake uh, of the uh, British mission at that time. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, this is Lynn Barry speaking. Um, I'm, yes, in the rock records, um, it, for example, they'll have the name of the branch and then they'll have the names of the members in that branch with the dates of their baptisms and who baptized them and who confirmed them and whether the men held the priesthood and that sort of thing. And that was common in the UK in the 1840s. So I would imagine that there must be records for the Gadfield Elm. They had to do those kind of returns at that time. So I would have thought they, though they must exist somewhere but they're not yet transcribing them all in England. We're, we're just working on Welsh records at the moment. Thank you, Lynn. Um, a question or yeah, from Victoria. How were the United Brethren and LDS churches accepted by local communities or were they opposed? The United Brethren didn't seem to have much um, persecution at all. Uh, they seem to be accepted in society. Um, they'd broken away from the primitive Methodists um, and they were still acting in the same way as the primitive Methodists were. So they didn't get 
much persecution. Um, Wilfred Woodruff comes along with uh, uh, the doctrine of the Book of Mormon and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and um, for some reason, a persecution was was around at that time. Um, uh, and even though they were United Brethren, people who joined the church, uh, the persecution was still against the church, not against the United Brethren. Um, I've often wondered about that and, and thought it's probably because they were Methodists. It was an English uh, church and um, an American coming over, it didn't really dwell with the people. And also, I think that uh, the fact that they were asked to, to leave their homes and uh, travel across to America. Uh, Rumours went around that there was a like a tunnel from uh, Britain to America, as you probably know. And these rumours went around, and 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 um, the people just didn't sort of like the Latter Day Saints. And um, Wilfred Woodruff was stoned and was asked to baptise a dog and uh, had to baptise at night because mobs would come around. Um, the United Brethren never experienced that at all. So, a bit like the church when they went to to America, uh, you know, they, they they were persecuted at the end in Nauvoo. Uh, but other churches didn't seem to get the persecution. Uh, but that was a situation. United Brethren seemed to be fine. Um, Rebecca Brown had asked, did we start late or was it cancelled? because don't worry, she missed a lot of it, but it's been recorded. So don't worry, Rebecca, you can watch the whole thing again. Um, the Hansons say thank you for the wonderful presentation. That's to you, Bernard. And um, from Robin Gray, this is probably our, it says in the early 1970s, I was a member of the Hereford branch and I was told by at least one member that there were thousands of converts in the Herefordshire and there were dozens of small, seating houses dotted around Hereford and thousands left for the USA from the area. I might have been told that but I don't I don't think there was that many from the Hereford area at all and not these little there was homes dotted around with the United Brethren and um, uh, a lot of people did go but I don't know whether it was in the thousands it might have been from Hereford itself, it probably been about three or four hundred over the ten year span. I don't know. Um, it's, yeah, it's sort of true, you yeah. know, sort of true. Yeah. And uh, I guess on that same question, Alex is saying that because it was such an agricultural dependent community, if eighteen hundred people left the area. It would have created quite a stir and a problem for the farmers. Um, might be good to clarify when we're talking about um, this chapel. Can you just explain? You, you showed the circuit. Can you just explain how wide that United Brethren circuit was, so they understand it's not just one chapel? The say so United Brethren split themselves into two areas. One was based around Castle Froom, which is where the Hill Farm was, and that probably stretched. Um, 15 miles to Hereford and 15 miles to Worcester. So it's, you know, that's sort of 25 to 30 mile across that way. And the depth would be about to Ledbury for another 10 miles. So it was 10, 10 miles by about 25 to 30 miles. That, that was the top area. Then where the Gadford Arm Chapel was, that was slightly smaller, probably about 15 miles by 10. Um, so it was a big area if you put them both together. Um, and, and how many units of the United Brethren were there? There were, um, uh, so I've got my book, let me just get my book, I'm always, uh, be a second, um, uh, right, there were um, 25 in the Frooms Hill circuit up by uh, the Bembo farm, and there were, so, 14 in the uh, Gadford Elm area. So, so 29 certain, branches. There was, 20, there was which then? There was 25 branches in the Frooms Hill circuit. Oh, sorry. And there was uh, 6, 9, 12, 15 in the, um, uh, the other area. So that's uh, 30, 39. 20, 39, yeah. Yeah. In the two, two areas, yeah. That's right. They had around about 40, 40 odd preachers, the United Brethren did. 
So that 39 basically was where the whole 1800 or so yes, yes. Yeah, from. Yeah. Yeah. The centre of the area was Ledbury and the, and the Malvern, Malvern area that seemed to revolve around there. Um, and yeah. So they, the, peop the people in the Froome's Hill circuit probably never got to Gadfield Elm Chapel at all, only a few of them. But they did have a building up at uh, Stanley Hill, uh, which is near the Hill Farm, where they, um, they had similar meetings to um, what they had at Gadfield Elm. It was a big building, but uh, there's uh, nothing there at the moment. It's probably gone years ago. Well, Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, just before we go, do you just want to give a little, um, I don't know, publicity to the fact that you, you're writing something? Oh, yes, um, <laughs> I'm writing a book. That's what I just referred to. Uh, it's, it's quite a few pages. <laughs> um, but I have written a little pamphlet um, here, which I will send. Um, send to you Peter and you can send it out to um to everybody it's, uh, you know on an email or and that that will tell you all about what what I've told you today really it's just a little pamphlet uh itemizing the things yeah cool. uh, the book will be ready next year sometime um thank you yeah. and that 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 um covers every day of Wilfred Woodruff's mission so um in in this area so every day I've written something, find a picture. I've been to where he was that day as well and um, tried to bring it to life. It's called Walking in Wil Wilfred Woodruff's Footsteps. We're getting there. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, Andrew. So oh, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Bernard, for a fantastic presentation, all your research and, and talks over 12 years. We're very privileged to have you. We apologize if uh, people had difficulty being admitted on time, um, but the, as Peter has mentioned, uh, we have recorded this session. So um, thank you for your questions and thank you for joining us for the eighth webinar of the British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association. So we ask for your feedback from this webinar, what we did well and what could be improved another time. We know about admitting. Um, we also welcome your suggestions for future topics and presenters. So please, um, you have my email address. So uh, uh, please um, um, send it to me and then I'll share it with Peter. And then for next month, over to you, Peter. Yeah, on the screen right now, you can see that our next webinar is on Friday, the 9th of December. And Joey Williams, um, trained opera singer in Paris, um, speaks fluently five languages fluently. I didn't know this, including American English. Look at that. <laughs> anyway, he's going to be joining us. And we're going to look at early Latter day hymns. So if you want to join us, 9th of December, make a note in your diary usual time, the seven to eight Greenwich Mean Time, and um, we'll send a, a registration thing out again as we've normally done. So we have recorded this session. We will send a link out to everybody who um, registers. And thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Bernard, for your time. Pleasure. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.